onto the Hyperog. As I mentioned in my last lecture, Europe at the start of the 17th century was divided between Catholics and Protestants of different varieties, and both kings and religious leaders were fighting to gain or regain adherence, sometimes on the battlefield, sometimes in the printing press, and sometimes in the world of art. From 1545 to 1563, the Catholic Council of Trent met in Trent, Italy to hammer out a strategy for combating Protestantism. The Council strongly condemned Protestant doctrines, but it also ordered significant changes to church administration and discipline that were intended to address some of Luther's criticisms. That's a lot of history summed up inadequately in two sentences. But for our purposes, it's most important to know that the Council of Trent not only upheld, but strongly advocated for the use of religious images in church. Basically, the church decided to seize on art as a weapon in its fight with Protestantism. And it was a smart move. The austere Protestant churches, with no art and sometimes even no music, might appeal to the intellect, but they had a hard time competing on an emotional level. The Catholic Church actually won a lot of Protestants back during the Counter-Reformation, and not only because they lost battles. To sum up all of this in a phrase that you should drag into any essay you write on Baroque art, the Church and its artists it patronized decided to go for high drama. Baroque art is all about religious theater. Big, boldly colored, carefully staged, packed with movement and emotion, spiraling figures, and tantalizing diagonal lines of sight. It was art designed to excite, even inflame the senses. I think it is unfair to say that Catholic Baroque art downgraded the intellect. The Jesuits, for example, were nothing if not intellectual. But in art, at least, the strategy was first to go for the gut. In this lecture, we're looking at the stage setting for these Baroque productions, Baroque churches and at some of their most famous props, Baroque sculpture. Today we will also see our last churches, at least among the required works. But guess which church isn't on the list? I really can't skip St. Peter's entirely, can I? I am, after all, teaching at a Catholic school. But I will race through this world-famous church pretty quickly, mostly to introduce this unit's only sculptor, Bernini, whose fingerprints are all over St. Peter's. We'll then go back to our two required churches and end, if time permits, with a quick review of how church architecture reflected changing visions of how a church should function in the community and in the world. So I just called this a Renaissance slash Baroque church. What Renaissance elements do you see? There's a lot of homage to ancient Greece and Rome in the triangular pediment and the entablature below it in the Corinthian columns, and in the classic dome that was designed by Michelangelo. But what about that upper story with its statues and ornate clocks? Those are Baroque elements that a new architect added when he reworked the facade. The most dramatic change to St. Peter's was not its facade, but the huge piazza that welcomed worshipers to the Eternal City. The architect of this piazza, Bernini, was also the most prominent sculptor of the Baroque era. Bernini was the son of a sculptor and a child prodigy who attracted the interest of the church when he was still a young boy. He became a close friend and confidant of several popes. He was a devout Catholic who attended Mass every morning before beginning his work, and he genuinely seems to have believed that his mission was to create art that glorified God. Bernini was also a playwright and the leader of a troupe of actors who performed for popes. Here's a quote from a contemporary who recorded that, quote, Bernini gave a public opera wherein he painted the scenes, cut the statues, invented the engines, that is, the machines that moved the, the scenery, composed the music, wrote the comedy, and built the theater. Everything that Bernini created is imbued with this sense of what made for good theater. I've chosen this brief clip because it also introduces the other great architect that we will explore today, Borromini, and one of our required churches. These are two of Bernini's most famous works for St. Peter's, but they're not on the list. Still, you should be able to see how he goes for Baroque. Sigh, this work isn't required either, but I refuse to skip it. Bernini's David is all coiled action. It reaches into the space around it, what art analysts call negative space. This David is not Donatello's contemplative youth or Michelangelo's calm warrior. Bernini's David is an intense, furious fighter. 
out to destroy his enemy and to save his people. He is, in other words, a counter-reformation warrior. And here are a couple more non-required Bernini statues, both basically attempted rape scenes from classical mythology. Again, we see many typical Baroque features, the dramatic movement, the reach into negative space, the spiraling composition, and we see really amazing textures created in what you might think was cold marble. Okay, finally, here's our first required work, Bernini's famous sculpture of the ecstasy of St. Teresa and the over-the-top chapel in which it was housed also designed by Bernini. Bernini did not design the church, which is also a required work, but I'm going to save that one to go with our other churches. So, what are the Baroque elements of this sculpture? Again, we see the twisting figures, the spiring, spiraling diagonal lines, the extension out into negative space, and the profound emotion. We also see marble that almost like it's going to melt under the flame of the Holy Spirit. So just what kind of ecstasy is St. Teresa experiencing? Here is a second clip from our Bernini video. The narrator, by the way, is one of my favorite historians, Simon Shama. In this and the next unit, we'll see other clips from this series, The Power of Art. What makes this work even more remarkable is its staging. The chapel itself is really an elaborate theater for religious drama, complete with an audience of patrons. Let's watch one last video clip. The College Board also includes this church, which houses the Cornaro Chapel, among the required images. Oddly, it doesn't list the architect, who's the architect who designed the final facade of St. Peter's. What departures do we see from Renaissance architecture? The triangular pediment is now a curve. The columns are square. The engaged pilasters, not rounded columns. And we now have those scroll features on the second story. Do you remember their name from Greek art? Their volutes, characteristic of Ionic order architecture, even though the engaged columns have Corinthian capitals. The tall, narrow design reflects not only Baroque taste, but also the reality of building in Rome, where real estate was now scarce and pricey. And here is the Borromini church that you saw in the first video clip. Note the undulating curves, what a great word, undulating, and how they alternate between convex and concave surfaces, surfaces that cave in, surfaces that cave out. Just as striking is the extremely ornate geometric pattern of the dome. Renaissance simplicity is a distant memory. Note that Borromini had to figure out how to build an impressive church on a narrow corner lot that faced onto two intersecting streets. He also had to figure out a way to fit in both a church and a cloister for the religious order's convent. Here's the floor plan that's another required work. And here's a labeled floor plan and cutaway that made the construction clearer. The vertical cutaway shows the extraordinary complexity of the church's three-level design. If the convex concave exterior seems ornate and entirely unclassical, the interior design is in some ways a throwback to the Renaissance in that it is precisely mathematical. What has changed is the math. I didn't see this mentioned in the readings or podcast, but I had a theory about this oval or ellipse from my long ago ventures into pre-calculus back in the Triassic era. So I googled Borromini and Kepler and I found what I thought I would. Kepler's theories of planetary motion were a major influence on Borromini. Remember that this isn't only the time of the Counter-Reformation. It's also the beginning of the scientific revolution. It was Kepler who discovered that the planets moved in elliptical, not circular orbits. So ellipses, it turns out, were the geometry of God's creation. Borromini's elliptical dome, moreover, can be described with reference to two inscribed circles, which in turn define two triangles. In other words, Borromini wasn't rejecting the geometrical purity of classical Greece and Renaissance Italy. He was just bringing it up to date with recent mathematical and scientific discoveries. Borromini did not employ color with Bernini's abandon. The surfaces of the walls and ceiling are white, but Borromini did provide for theatrical lighting. Windows are hidden in the lower dome, and there are also windows in this side of the lantern. So the illuminated lantern with its symbol of the Holy Trinity acts as a kind of spotlight, throwing the coffering of the dome into sharp and deep relief. From the dome, light gradually filters downward to the darker lower body of the church, where the audience uh, congregation sits. Drum rolls! This is our last required church. I don't entirely approve of leaving out some very important 20th century churches, but the ECB, as usual, did not consult me. 
The exterior of our last required church looks a whole lot like the Church of Santa Vittoria, which houses the Cornaro Chapel, pictured here on the right. Il Gesù is actually the older of the two churches, and it influenced the design of Baroque churches all around the world. Basically, we see the same classical features with typical Baroque flourishes, such as the volutes. Il Gesù played a very important role in the history of the Catholic Church. It is the mother church of the Jesuit order, built at the request of the order's founder, St. Ignatius of Loyola. So let me share a comment by a Jesuit priest and a professor at the Jesuit University of San Francisco, Father Tom Lucas. Quote, Il Gesù's facade achieves Ignatius's ideal of the church as a gateway through which the Jesuits emerge for their apostolic activities in the city and in the world, and through which the city is drawn into the sacramental life of the church. The opening lines of the Jesuit order's founding document declare that the society was created for whoever desires to serve as a soldier of God. The Jesuits were the shock troops of the Counter-Reformation, and they completely bought into the Counter-Reformation belief that art, wielded properly, was a potent weapon in the battle for souls. I threw in a few paintings of the Jesuits' missionary activities in Japan, Mexico, and Africa, and a painting of St. Ignatius by one of this unit's heavy hitters, Rubens. Stay tuned. In 2013, the church elected its first Jesuit pope, who took the name Francis. The layout of Il Gesù reflected both the Jesuits' stated mission and the proclamations of the Counter-Reformation. Let's hear again from Professor and Father Lucas. The interior accentuates the two great functions of a Jesuit church. Its large central nave with a laterally placed pulpit serves as a great auditorium for preaching, and the highly visible and prominent altar serves as a theatrical stage for the celebration of the real presence in the Eucharist. The ceiling frescoes came later after the order had accumulated some serious cash. This is high Baroque drama with the action spilling, as it were, off the stage and down toward the audience. Still more from Father Lucas, quote, the vault fresco representing the glory of the holy name of Jesus seems to open up a hole in the ceiling through which heavenly light pours onto downward cascading colossal figures and into the nave and altar. Thus, the Jesuit church becomes not only a gateway to and from the world, but a window into paradise. These theatrical effects are created by illusionistic painting, another favorite Baroque technique. So, sorry, here's a little vocabulary download. You've encountered Trump Doyle or Fool of the Eye before. It's a broad term for illusion, such as painting walls to look as if they have three-dimensional columns or statues. De Soto and Sue is a technique often used using foreshortened figures and an architectural vanishing point to create a perception of deep space on a ceiling. Quadratura involves painting architectural features on a flat surface to create the illusion of a three-dimensional space. Leaving aside these technical details, what's the effect of this ceiling fresco on the audience? What impression does the ceiling leave with the person sitting in the pews? Heaven is bursting into earth. The spiritual is invading the earthly, to quote a Baroque composer, George Friedrich Handel's Hallelujah Chorus, which is quoting Revelation 11:15, the kingdom of this world is becoming the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. Hallelujah. You may or may not have time for this, but you just heard about how the Jesuit mother church, Il Jesu, was designed and decorated in a way that served the objectives of the order to reach urban crowds with preaching, to emphasize the central role of the Eucharist, and to wield spectacular, illusionistic, theatrical art to make the spiritual world real and powerful to the congregation. The churches we have studied throughout the course all share the basic functions of promoting communal worship and personal devotion, but they also reflect their creators and their societies' more specific religious objectives, that is, the context of their own times. Each student group will be given a church. Take a few minutes to review your notes, and if you'd like, check the internet. This is the question you're trying to answer. How does the church decoration and design promote objectives that are specific to its patron and its, again, specific cultural context? You're going to report back with a one-minute answer. In other words, we're looking for a few very important points, the big picture rather than the details. <laughs> 